this down to a Jewish level. <laughs> Are we on? Okay. If you look at your outline and you can turn your Bibles to Psalm 90. We begin with uh, three areas of introduction and first of all, Kapilain, the uniqueness of the psalm. It's a unique psalm because as you do a study of the book of Psalms as a whole, and the individual psalms were written by different people at different points of history, you will notice they often repeat what others have said, there's always repetition, always quotations, and so on, but no statement within this psalm will you find in any other psalm. It simply has no affinity with the other psalms. It has a similar affinity with one of other psalms that Moses wrote in the book of um, Deuteronomy chapter 33, for example. So notice um, the subtitle in the, over the Psalm 19, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. And that's what it's called here, the Man of God. Just for a moment, turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33. And that chapter 33, verse 1, in, as a title to the psalm, or song, found in this chapter. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, bless the children of Israel. And here you have just one example of the affinity. I will point out some others, though we will not look them up in this particular 33rd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. But in both such places, he's introduced as simply the man of God. And uh, this means that if Moses wrote this psalm, and that's what the text says, this is the oldest of the 150 psalms in the book. Mm. The first one written. All the other psalms became, um, came subsequent <coughs> to this particular psalm. The couple be the timing and historical background. Moses wrote this psalm towards the end of the 40 years of witness wanderings. The Exodus generation has now passed away, and now a new generation of Israel, the wilderness generation, is soon to enter the Promised Land. It writes it specifically from the background of what happened in the Book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, Numbers 13 and 14, the sin of Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is a very beautiful oasis which is right on the border of the Promised Land. Once you walk past that oasis, you would already be inside the Promised Land. And from that oasis, Moses sent out 12 spies to spy out the land. They came back 40 days later. All agreed at one point, the land is what God says it is, a land that flows with milk and honey. Then came a, a crucial point of disagreement. Only two of these 12 men said, God is with us, we can take the land. But 10 men said, oh no, because of their numerical superiority of the Canaanites and the military strength, there's no possibility for us to take the land. As people often do today, they assume the majority must always be right. And therefore, there was a massive rebellion against the authority of Aaron and Moses, in fact, that was the tenth act of rebellion since the Exodus. And um, Moses and Aaron almost lost their lives in the mob scene until God intervened. But at that point, the Exodus generation reached the point of no return. And God withdrew the offer of the Promised Land, not from Israel, but from one generation of Israel, the Exodus generation. And now they'll have to continue wandering over the next 38 year period to let you one that came out of Egypt will die out, except for the two good spies and those below the age of 20. So over this 38-year uh, period, Moses saw about 1,200,000 people die, and that was the adult population that left the land of Egypt. And so the wilderness became a huge cemetery. It was supposed to be only a 10-day crossing period from Mount Sinai into the Promised Land, but as a result, it became a large cemetery. 
For example, on the average, there'll be 31,580 people dying per year. And furthermore, there will be 87 funerals every single day. And that's what happened. So Moses writes at the end of this 40-year period of wilderness wanderings, a 30-year period, as we shall see, was limited in its development and its recording of its history. Now the three main divisions that you see on your outline on the capital C is going to be threefold. First of all, in verses 1 through 6, he makes a comparison and a contrast between God's eternality, the eternalness of God, as well against the transitoriness of man, the limitations of human life. The second part will be verses 7 through 12, and in verses 7 through 12, that gives the reason for human transitoriness because of the temporal nature of human life, and that is the problem of human sin. And the third part is going to be in verses 13 to 17, where Moses gives a prayer to God with four specific prayer requests that God now visit his servants, the people of Israel, and build upon his eternity through their mortality. And with that background, we're going to try to give a basic exposition of the psalm within the limitations of time. So Roman number one, the eternality of God and the transitoriness of man is Psalm 90 verses 1 through 6 in capital A, capital A, the eternality of God in Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2. And in verse 1, he describes the God of Israel as this world's dwelling place. And God, ha uh, and verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. And God has been Israel's dwelling place not spasmodically but through all of Israel's generations thus far. The Hebrew term for dwelling place has the meaning a protective shelter. A protective shelter. And God has been Israel's protective shelter the days of Abraham until this point of time. And this, here we see another affinity with Deuteronomy chapter 32 because in verse 27 Moses wrote, the eternal God is your dwelling place underneath are the everlasting arms. So God can be high and God can be lofty, but he's not inaccessible. He's available to his servants, which in this context are the people of Israel. And then in verse two describes God as the eternal one. Before the mountains were brought forth, you have another affinity with Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 15. And when people make covenants, there will always be some witnesses, at least two witnesses, that would witness the covenant signing. But because the uniqueness of God's eternity and human frailty, human limited life, what God appointed was the mountains to be the witnesses when he made his Mosaic covenant of the Sinaitic covenant in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And, but, and as old as these mountains are, God pre-existed these mountains. He goes on to say, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, not only did God pre-exist -pre these ancient mountains, he also pre-existed. Genesis chapter one, verse one. The different uh, words used for the concept of the earth or the world, the first the word he uses in this verse means the world in general. The second term he uses means the world which is productive where humans live. So whether we're talking about the whole globe of the world or only that part of the world which has humans living at this point of history, God is even older than all of these coming into existence. He preceded in uh, Genesis 1.1 and, um, and so on. And finally, he expresses God's eternity from everlasting to everlasting from eternity past to eternity future, from before time was and when time will be no more. He is God overseeing all these things. So verses one, two, notice three key attributes of God. First of all, he's called in Hebrew, in the Hebrew text, Adonai, meaning Lord, which means he's the sovereign God, which means that nothing ever catches him by surprise. Certain things like the Noahic flood could come by his director will, 
of the elements come by his permissive will like the fall of man. And God never looks down from heaven and sees what people are doing and says, I can't believe that they did that. <laughs> Nothing catches him by surprise. It's, everything that happens is within the will of God, whether it's his directed will or merely his permissive will. Secondly, these two verses describe Mr. Tender God, the dwelling place, the protective shelter. He said, tender, and even periods of Israel's complaints and disobedience, he still served as the dwelling place. And thirdly, he's the timeless God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's the nature of God. But now as we come to capital B, in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, we have the transitoriness of man, with verse 3 uh, describing his frailty. You turn man to destruction. So several different words which are rendered in English by the word man, or humanity. But this particular Hebrew word emphasizes man in his frailty, in his weakness. And the Hebrew word for destruction is a bit stronger than English implies. It means to be pulverized to dust. To be pulverized to dust. This is a Hebrew word used only in this one verse, never used anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible. And so the fate or the future of humanity is to return to a pulverized dust. And that's in contrast to God's deathlessness. And so return ye children of men. And while there is this unique um, future of man, man lives under the under constant discipline or judgment. But at the same time, there is a called repentance. We sometimes think the word repent means to be sorry for our sins, but the word repent just simply means to change your mind. And what we change our mind about depends on the context. And so even God is said to be repenting of certain things, but God will never be sorry for his sins. He doesn't commit any. But it does mean that um, he changed his mind or his program or his um, covenantal agreements at some point of time. And so they're doing the, uh, so he says, return your children to men, that's a call to repentance. And while sometimes the purpose of divine judgment is to cause massive destruction, as was the case with the Noahic flood, other times is to drive people to repent, to change their mind about what they disbelieved and begin believing. And that will be more the context in this psalm. And in verse 4, he goes on to describe the timelessness of God. And time has no meaning with God. For a thousand years in your sight. And what, the, what Moses now will try to do is to compare God's eternity or even the extended human life and how short it is in comparison to God's eternity. He begins by saying or implying that God, the best comparison with human life is that it's only one day long in comparison to God's eternity. But then he realizes that's a bit long. Then he cuts in half. That's a 12 hour day and furthermore it's a 12 hour day which is the night time. And so 1000 years of God is like only a night in the life of man. So not even a full day, only a 12 hour night. Uh, and then that seems to be too long of a comparison. So he then says, as a watch in the night, and there were in, in the Jewish context, three different watches of the night, each watch was four hours long. And so now the thousand years of God is reduced to only four hours of human life. But it's four hours of the night, of which the sleeper takes no reckoning and which has vanished upon his awakening. In other words, we go to bed and then wake up six, eight hours later, not even conscious that eight hours or six hours of our life has just gone by while we're sleeping. And the point he's trying to make is that so much of our time is simply passing without us being conscious of it, and parts of it are simply unavoidable. We need to sleep, we need to rest. But also sometimes it's based upon poor planning with a sense of apathy, plus obligations to God, developing an apathy to things of God. So the point is, life is short in comparison to God. It's like only one day. No, it's only a 12 hour day, but it's the night of the day. Or it's only a watch of the night. <laughs> Some of you heard my rabbi stories. One of my favorite rabbi stories is a good verse, that a good rabbi story illustrate verse four. 
And uh, the background is that in Judaism, we're never taught to pray extemporaneously with our own words. All our prayers are through prayer books. So in Judaism, we have a daily prayer book, we have a Sabbath prayer book, we have a prayer book very special occasion like the Passover, Feast of Trumpets, and things of that nature. The stories of a rabbi, now elderly, is retired from the rabbinate. His old age, he came to recognize that in his old age, he does not know the God of Israel any better now than when he was a child. He made a very unusual decision for a rabbi. He closed his prayer book, but the first time pray with his own words, and then maybe he'll hear the voice of God. And if so, then maybe he can ask God a few questions to get to know the God of Israel better. So he closed his prayer book, and for the first time began praying with his own words. In the beginning, he stumbled a lot. He was not used to praying that way. After a while, he got more, sm more smooth, more eloquent. And after he prayed for a long time, he hears a voice from heaven. Yes, Rabbi, what do you want from me? Rabbi says, I want to ask you just a few questions to get to know you better. And the voice says, so ask. Well, my first question is, what does, uh, ta what does uh, time mean to you? And God says, time to me is like this. One second is like a million years. A million years to me is like one second. Rabbi says, huh? Well, my second question is, what does money mean to you? And God says about the same, Once one penny is like a million dollars. A million dollars is like one penny. Rabbi says, in that case, I have a third question. May I please have one of your pennies? <laughs> And God said, of course, just wait one second. My <laughs> <laughs> stories have a logic there, but logic just doesn't work right. That's a nice example. <laughs> then in verse 5, he comes to the certainty of death. You carry death away as with a flood. Eventually, death will take on. Unless there's some kind of divine intervention that has occurred only twice so far, in the case of, um, of Enoch, in the case of Elijah. And at the rapture, there'll be many more exceptions, but the normal thing to anticipate is eventually we're all going to die. And they are asleep, but the sleep here is the sleep of death, the temporary suspension of physical activity until we wake up in the resurrection. And the point of this first part of verse 5 is, life is not only short in comparison to God, unlike God, eventually it will terminate. In the second part of verse 5 and verse 6, he, point, he, he points out that the beauty of life is shorter than life itself. So he says at the end of verse 5 in the first part of verse uh, 6, in verse 5, in the morning the like grass which grows up, Verse 6 in the morning, it will flourish, it will grow up, but then in the evening, at the end of verse 6, it, it is cut down, it withers. And the whole emphasis of the, uh, these two verses is the lifespan of flowers in the land of Israel. And the flowers of Israel that grow in the, in the open fields have very short lifespan. They come up around the middle of March, but by mid-April, they're burned dry by the sun, and they disappear. And now the four hours of human life are still not the length of our productivity. Our early years need to be spent in developing. We have to learn how to crawl, need to learn how to walk, we need to learn to talk, and so on. But uh, in our late years, there's a sapping of our mental abilities, a sapping of our strength. And now those four hours are reduced to about only two or three hours in comparison to God's eternity, I wish you can be productive for the Lord. So the human life is frail, it is brief. And compared to God's eternity, it's very short. So no matter how long we live, we have a limited time to be productive for the Lord. So the point he makes in, in this verse is, because life is brief, we must make time to count for the Lord. We must carefully plan out our lives to make them most productive for the Lord that we serve. Let go to your next page on your outline.
Now, verses 7 through 12, we have the source of the problem, human sin, with capital A, the death of man, in verses 7 through 9.1, the reason for man's untimely death, brings us to verse 7. It begins with the word for, and that word introduces an explanation for what he just talked about in the first six verses. For, we are consumed in your anger, in your wrath are we troubled meaning we are often hurried away in untimely death. And this is the recognition of Moses of the results of Kadesh Barnea. Many people died not from natural causes, not from all but from a direct divine judgment because of another act of rebellion. And the reason for the judgment, he says, you have set our iniquities before you, set before God to come unto judgment at some point. Our secret sins in light of your countenance and what they may keep many of our secrets hidden from others. None of them are hidden from God's sight. Ultimately, they'll bring them to light for punishment. And in verse 9, the whole life is under the wrath of God. And notice the extent, for all our days are passed away in your wrath, and the hours of sunlight begin to get less and less, get shorter and shorter because of the darkness that's caused by the wrath of God. And eventually it will terminate. We bring our years to an end as a sigh. The deep word for sigh is sometimes used when a person has worked very hard, he's very tired, and he kind of breathes out a sigh of tiredness. But the second word is used, which is the case here, the last breath we exhale before death takes over, or as death takes over, the last breath we've been exiled. It, and um, as Romans chapter 1 verse 18, Romans 1 18 declares, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. Unbelievers live their whole life under the wrath of God, and some will experience the wrath of God in this life, but all those who die in unbelief will experience the wrath of God in the next life. And Believers are not under the wrath of God, as we learn from Romans chapter 5, verse 9. And so wrath of God does not fall upon believers, but what does fall upon believers is God's discipline. As in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. In that passage, the of Hebrews points out that, um, that if a person claims to be a believer and never seems to suffer any kind of discipline, then you can, you can now conclude that he's never been a true born-again believer. Because God would not allow a believer to live life in rebellion indefinitely. At some point, the discipline will come. So some of us did experience the discipline in this life, and some of us will experience it in the next life. And when we all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, described in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15, that um, some of us will have nothing to show how we served the Lord since we believed. He points out, one effect of our salvation, he says, he himself shall be saved, their souls by fire. So in the Messianic kingdom, there'll be believers, members of the body of the Messiah, they'll have nothing to show for their service of the Lord since they believed. But as we shall see a little bit later in this psalm, there are ways to minimize the discipline of, the, of God and to look forward in terms of receiving a reward. So we come to capital B, the lifespan of man and the wrath of God in verses 10 and 11. And he, in verse 10 describes the years of our life. The lifespan, the days of our years, are 70. That's the basic minimum that many people did not survive till the age of 70. Or by reason of strength 80, that's the basic maximum, but some may live longer. But the, uh, but the span of human life is between 70 and 80 on the average. But there's a vanity to it, or could be, yet is their pride but labor and sorrow, a time of travail, a time of, a time of vanity, a tribe, a time of emptiness. And it is soon gone and we fly away. So what initially appears to us as being a long time ends up being rather short. And life flies away like a fleeting bird. Now when we were teenagers, for the most part, we were not conscious of our mortality. We have a long way to go before we get old and die. 
We talk to senior citizens. They often comment about how quickly time has gone for them. And that is the nature of how we judge time as we go from young to old age. And the cause of it is in verse 11, the wrath of God. Who knows the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear that is due to you? The lessons here are, first of all, few are those who appreciate the intensity of divine wrath which arouses by sinfulness. When there's some kind of catastrophe falling on the earth, like the present one with the COVID-19, and you, you always have a larger interest in things of, the, of God, a larger interest in the area of what's happening. And as a result, in a minority of cases, people come to faith, but in the majority of the cases, once the crisis is over, people go back to the way things were before the crisis hit. And so, again, few are those who appreciate the intensity of God's divine wrath that's aroused by sinfulness. And furthermore, in how few does the wrath of God induce a sense of fear to turn away from sin? So again, this is the evaluation by Moses of the sin of Kadesh Barnea. As we come to verse 12, capital C, he now provides the application of the lesson. So teach us to number our days. He's addressing this to God. God, teach us to number our days. So the importance of this knowledge about numbering our days is to be learned from what God has been teaching. And one of these ways he's been teaching is right in the psalm. To number our days means to realize how few they really are. And not in all our days we'll be able to be productive. Some of us have more time because we became believers in our youth. Others uh, were well, saved only in the Middle Ages, others in their old age. So the number of days available will differ with different people. We should count our days to, with the full knowledge of understanding the consequences of unworthy days. Now here's an exercise uh, one of my seminary professors has suggested, and I do this on a regular basis, and you can try this only maybe for one or two months. And that is this. Count how many days you have left till to before you reach your 70th birthday. If you're already past 70, then count how many days you have to live until your 80th birthday. If you already reached the age of 80, you're living on borrowed time. <laughs> <laughs> and then each day, just maybe for a month or two, just, uh, uh, just reduce it by one, one number. I now have so many days before to serve the Lord. I will be so many days to be productive for the Lord. I do this every day, but uh, for most people, it's enough to do it for one or two months because some people begin to, begin to get morbid and get up and say, oh dear, I'm down to only 15,780 days to live. But it's a good way to begin to uh, knowledge of how to count and begin to plan our days. Yesterday, I had my 77th birthday, double seven. forgot to give me a cake, but never mind, you probably couldn't afford that many candles. <laughs> and so I have 1,095 days before I reach the 80th birthday. I might not make it to that day. I might, I might um, go beyond those days. So we might live less, we might live more, but even for the days we now have, we need to be productive for the Lord. Amen. And our level of productivity will not always be the same. So with what we now have, we should count for eternity, not just for time. And our goal should be to set things in the will of God and be sensitive to change those plans as so he wills. And like the writer of James has clearly taught the Jewish believers of that day who are businessmen traveling in making business, it is one thing to plan, but God can change those plans to so always bring in the concept in the will of the Lord, we'll do this. In the, will of the, in the will of God, we shall do that. Keep in mind, Kadesh Barnea was the killing of time for 38 years, with not much positive accomplished. The same monotonous every single day. Go out, pick up some manna, cook different things with the manna, make sure you do double on Friday, there won't be any manna on the Sabbath. And if the monotony was broken, it was only broken because there was some act of rebellion required 
instantaneous divine judgment. If you count the number of chapters recording the period of time the time they crossed the Red Sea until they reached the east side, the east bank of the Jordan River, there's 125 chapters total. Only five of those chapters covered that 38 year period. So that 120 covered the first year and the last year, and that's it. Only five chapters cover that the, that the 38 years in between, and that's to record different acts of rebellion, different judgments, and different massive executions by divine grant. Now the purpose of counting our days is that we may get a heart of wisdom. In the Greek concept, gaining wisdom is to be able to develop um, mostly philosophical schemes. But in the Hebrew concept, it means learning skill in living, developing skill in living our daily lives. So what is wisdom in the biblical context? And that is to gain skill in living our daily lives. And for believers, it should be skill in living a godly life, a life to serve the Lord with. And that includes all works, both great and small. And so the new generation, the wilderness generation, should not waste time like the next generation, the old one did. Now, uh, those years were wasted, but nothing could be done by, by wasting years. We now must make a commitment to use the time we have from now on to serve the Lord. The, um, the book of Corinthians was written to a church which was primarily a Gentile church, but, they had, but the believers in that church had been saved long enough to have achieved spiritual maturity. Even those that were saved a long time never progressed from immaturity to maturity, not from milk to meat, but were always, they, they were carnal, true believers, but carnal. There's nothing that could be done for, about those wasted years, so much of Corinthians is devoted to what they must now do. But the same thing was true with Jewish believers. And in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 6, Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 6, he writes to Jewish believers that have been saved long enough to be teachers of the word, but now they need to be retaught the same basic ABC principles, because they never, never moved on from immaturity to maturity. And so they must now reconsider how they have been living and thinking, and not to begin to be productive for the Lord. And if we do not have that wisdom, James chapter 1, verse 5, he writes, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But he also points out, we don't just recite something, this is something we need. Rather, it is something that um, we know is, we have to fully believe that God will grant it. And if we fully believe that this is a request God will grant, he will grant it. And we can develop our, our skill of living in the concept of biblical wisdom. So we come to the Roman Rumor 3, prayer for the return of God's favor in Psalm 90 verses 13 to 17. And notice the four prayer requests all listed on your outline carefully. Prayer for the turning away of God's wrath in verse 13. Return, O Yahweh, Jehovah, how long? Return, meaning turn away your wrath. Turn it around. Turn the wrath that was on this old generation, turn it away. How long? How long will you be angry? Let it repent you concerning your servants. He has God to repent, but again, something means to change his program. Let the wrath on the extra generation extend now, not, not extend to the wilderness generation. Let it not extend to your servants, Israel. And the first prayer request, let sorrow now be turned into joy. And now turn away the wrath that was on the extra generation, let it not continue into this new generation. In the second prayer request, capital B, to remember God's come to love in verse 14. The request is, O oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness. In the morning. We saw the phrase used earlier, in the shortness of the life of the flower. Now it's used also in the concept for God speedily to come back to Israel, not with wrath, but loving kindness. After all the troubles of the night, may there be a new era of joy for the people of Israel. The Hebrew word loving kindness is a word you should know, the word chesed. And chesed has the meaning of covenantal loyalty, covenantal faithfulness, covenantal loyalty. 
from the basis of God's covenantal loyalty, and this would be the Abrahamic covenant, let there be now a remembrance of this covenant faithfulness, and may there be a new era for the people of Israel. And the reason, the result will be, do may rejoice and be glad all our days. Deeper word for rejoice means to be to sing in ringing tones. To sing in ringing tones <laughs> emphasizes external joy. But the second word that rendered English as be glad emphasizes internal joy. So may there be both internal joy and external joy all our days. Do may enjoy our life abundantly, but then keep passing it in sorrow, which was true for the exit generation. And the third prayer request is prayer for proportionate restoration in verse 15. And the comparison he makes is this, make us glad according to days where you have afflicted us and the years where we have seen evil. And the point of this third prayer request is this, after the restoration of God's favor, covenantal faithfulness, may the enjoyment of the abundant life be proportionate to the period of suffering where God's wrath burned against the Exodus generation. In other words, we've suffered your wrath for 38 years, now may we suffer your covenantal faithfulness for 38 years. May there be proportionate restoration. And then fourthly, the work of God and the work of man in verses 16 and 17. The work of God is in verse 16. Let your work appear unto your servants, and the work of God's providence be made evident in his dealings with our lives as individual believers, and your glory upon their children. The Hebrew word used for glory is not the normal Hebrew word, but it emphasizes the beauty of God, the glory of his beauty, the beauty of the Lord. So let Israel now have a demonstration of divine splendor as revealed in God's saving power. That thing mentions, and to their children, so earlier he asked for proportionate restoration, 38 years, but now he also asked for God's unique grace and covenantal love to be extended to the subsequent generations that will come after the wilderness generation. And then we come to verse 17, the work of man. The request is, let favor of the Lord our God be upon us. The word Hebrew word for favor means the pleasantness of God. Let's now enjoy the beauty of God and the pleasantness of God in contrast to the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Beauty in place of wrath, pleasantness in place of judgment. And, for, and that is what's described by believers today by the New Testament, enjoying the abundant life. And the means is, establish you the work of our hands upon us. The work of our hands are the daily tasks that's to be done to the will and obedience to the Lord, to the God that we can do to glorify Him. So the works of God in verse 16 is to be done through the works of men, and the work of our hands become the work of the hands of God. So again, skillfulness in living daily for the work of the Lord, so that eternity and not time becomes the real goal of our life's work. And keep in mind what we do should not really be because somebody has to do it. But whatever it is, we should do it with the consciousness to bring glory to God. People often assume this is accomplished only to do the greater works of the body, like evangelizing, like teaching, and so on. But the Messiah said to his disciples, this half probably gives you a glass of water in my name. Will, will not lose his reward. If you give someone a, a need of water, and it cannot because it needs to be done, but to bring honor to God, even that small act will not go unrewarded. And so, for example, there's more to do in the local church than merely in the greater works. Here we, this is our chapel building and so on. And, um, and this, uh, for example, the carpets will need to be cleaned, the windows out there need to be washed, there's some cleaning to be done periodically, and so on. And if we do it consciously, to bring glory to God, it will be rewarded. 
as we have a time of refreshment and you make the coffee, if you make the coffee not because it needs to be done, but because you want to bring glory to God, will not go unrewarded. And there's ways to increase that reward. For example, if you make real coffee and not instant coffee, <laughs> the reward will go up. And if you, make, if you make regular coffee and not decaffeinated uh, coffee, the reward goes up even higher. Because <laughs> uh, I'm a coffee drinker, but I don't drink decaf because it tastes to me like a cow's afterbirth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how God's name, folks. When a cock gives birth, she decaffeinates. <laughs> and if you serve gourmet coffee and not restaurant coffee, the world gets even higher. So there are different ways that you can increase your reward. But again, the consciousness should be, I'm gonna bring glory, I'm gonna do this for the glory of God. And then he repeats what he says at the end of this verse. Yea, the works of our hands, you will establish it. It's repetition of emphasis. The work of God is to be accomplished to his servants, and we who believe are his servants. And they will thus enjoy success in their lives, although life itself is short. When I did my research for this psalm, I came across a quotation that I think catches what this psalm is saying. And this is a quotation. When God rebukes one for a sin, he feels most frail and transitory. But when he is blessed by God's favor, he feels most worthwhile. He shares in the work of the everlasting God. Weakened by God's discipline, one is keenly aware of his mortality. Abiding God's love and compassion, he is aware of being crowned with glory and honor. A shorter version of this we often heard, the life will, uh, this life will soon be passed only was done for the Messiah will last. Let me conclude with four basic lessons that this psalm is teaching us. Number one, we should be conscious that no matter how long we live, from the divine perspective, life will always be short. My mother's still living, she's gonna be 97. I wish she was a believer in December, she'll turn 97. She's not yet a believer, and she's losing some control of her mind. But, um, but no how long she lives, life is going to be counted as short. Secondly, no matter how long we live, not all of the years can be productive. Again, we, certain things have to take, uh, we need sleeping time and things of that nature. Thirdly, we should be conscious that we are mortal and realize how much time we have left in the world. And then fourthly, to work out how to be most productive for the Lord in time that we have left, doing God's work. Sila. If you would stay up here for just a moment, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, we've been blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen. What God is desiring to do is to reward you richly, and through Dr. Fruchtenbaum, he's reminded you of the brevity of your life. Some of us have full heads of hair. I remember having a full head of hair, and I am reminded by the absence of follicles that life is brief. And Dr. Fruchtenbaum encourages me to actually go through the exercise, number your days. Not all of them can be productive. Try to make the most of every moment. Dr. Fruchtenbaum, thank you very much. And it's just a small thing, but if we could sing happy birthday yeah. to Dr. Fruchtenbaum. <laughs> Y'all ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Happy birthday to you. All right, so uh, we are now closing things out, and we appreciate you being here. The church is beginning to resume normal services. Amen. We are endeavoring. Yes. <laughs> 
Now we want to say the church was never closed. Who opened the church? Jesus Christ opened the church. No one is going to close this church. Amen. And during the time when we were supposedly closed, our church actually grew. We actually picked up more families. We actually had more people coming. Because the moving of the Holy Spirit is not constrained by legislation or pandemics or anything else. It was never closed. It was never closed. In fact, if you're willing to receive it, the setback of the pandemic was used as a setup to spring forward. Amen. Yeah. The setback of the pandemic made us revisit what are we doing? And it has caused us to spring forward. But I'm asking you, please reflect on what Dr. Fruchtenbaum has said so that you can make the most of the moments that you have. Make the most, John. That's what I'm trying to do. Make the most of the moments. Would you pray us out? You bet. Thank you, sir. Let's pray together. Father, we are very aware of the limited part of our mortality. And Father, you have told us to number our days, and well, we should. Father, this message, oftentimes given at a funeral, memorial service because the message is for those who are still alive who still have that opportunity to number their days to consider their own life not the one who's deceased those who are living Moses speaks to us even today we should take it to heart and have that heart of wisdom Father as we leave this place we do so with that mindset the present for today. We do not know how many are left, but we should be about our Father's business. We pray this in the name of our Messiah, our Christ Jesus, and all the people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.